If you remember when we done the suspension, we said we were going to do the final drives once the parts that we needed had turned up. I'm glad to say that the bearings have now arrived and we've started to put the final drive assemblies back together. You can see one here that is wait waiting to be fitted. Um, you've got a stub axle unusually which um, bolts onto the back of the hull. Modern day tanks have um, final drive units which bolt on in their entirety. We've had to build this up from the gearing at the front here to the sprocket ring carriers and the sprockets that will go on them. Um, this one's ready to go in. If we go over to the next one, you'll see this one's now fitted. We've got one uh, set of sprocket rings on it. There'll be another set on the inside. Just to explain how this all works, the two massive engines inside here will transfer all the power to the um, transmission. This is then fed through a stub axle onto this gear wheel, which then through the sprocket rings and the sprocket ring carriers engage in the tank in order to drive it forward. It also gives the tank the ability to steer by slowing down or stopping one of these um, sets of sprockets and the tank will move in that direction. These are the steering clutches for the vehicle. There are two of them, one for each track. They're mounted between the gearbox and the final drives. The vehicle is steered by a clutch and brake mechanism um, it's a fairly crude system of steering a track vehicle. Basically a, a large band brake is applied to the outer of the brake drum, like so. That stops the drum revolving. There is a series of cams machined into the face of the drum there. On that part of the clutch, which, which is the outer of the clutch, which runs inside the brake drum, there's a set of three rollers which ride up onto these cams at that point, that then separates the clutch plates, which are mounted internally inside the drum. That disconnects the drive to the particular track that it's operating on. If you want to just stop the vehicle as a stopping brake, you pull back on both steering levers and it simply stops on the brakes once you've decelerated. The clutch is quite a complicated arrangement. It consists of layers of steel and friction material. That's one of the friction material discs which we're replacing because originally they're asbestos and we have to replace all that type of component now. So these are modern materials. You start off, that one will be actually be riveted to that plate there. We've actually been removed drilling the rivets out because we have to drill the, the new plate and then rivet new ones on. So it's, again, this is at the early stages of rebuild. I'll just move those plates and I'll demonstrate how these actually go together. So again, on the inside, of this outer of the steering clutch. Then we have a set of toothed steel friction plates. This is an old one which we did refer to quite a while ago when we started the restoration. It was actually broken and cracked. Since then we've had replacement ones manufactured in the same material. I'll just demonstrate that actually slots into the the drum like so. Now it's not quite sliding at the moment because we haven't cleaned the, the drum out and done some hand, we need to do a bit of hand fitting. Then that would actually be mounted internally like so. That's the inner of the clutch. Again, there'd be another friction material, which I'll just sort out for the parts. This, these are loose, they're not riveted. Drops in like so. Then there's an internally toothed plate, which then drops around the circumference, like that. And then there's a whole stack of those. And as I mentioned, when it's operated, it will lift off, they, because the, the cams have lifted them, it lifts off, the steering clutches separate, and the drive to that particular track, whichever one you've operated, is broken and you'll do a skid steer. Um, it's not a progressive steering, like some more modern tanks or regenerative steering such as on a Comet, etc. It's simply on and off. Um, if you do try and do them progressively, you do wear the clutch plates very quickly. Just to go through the operation then of the uh, steering clutch. On the outside, we have this brake drum, which goes around this outer drum. On the inside, you've got another drum and a plate with loads of powerful springs underneath it. These compressed plates inside, um, but the action of them being compressed actually forces the drive out to the tracks and allows the tank to move forward. When the driver wants to make a turn, he'll pull in, in this case, on his right steering lever. This operates this control rod, 
through the steering actuator and compresses the brake pad onto the outer disc. That stops or slows down that outer disc and the inner one then starts to rotate. These rollers then roll up these cams, as Bob's described, which separates the plates on the inside and disconnects the drive from this side of the tank. Because the drive is already operating on the other side, that enables the vehicle to steer. As you can hear, there's a bit of noise coming from the gear wheel as we turn it. It's turning nice and freely, but with the oil in, a lot of that noise will go away. The only thing to be fitted now is, is the rear uh, gear case cover, which you've been, seen being worked on before on the milling machine. Um, and once we've um, got the second and uh, final drive unit on, uh, we'll fit both these covers and get some oil in them. Get this on there, yeah, will you? and then, yeah. then we yeah. can lift this up be within a few and clamp minutes. it. Yeah. Yeah. Whilst the electrical fit is going on, we've also been working on the hull and we're trial fitting the fuel tanks. The reason we're doing that is because all of the pipes and services that connect to these and the oil um, are all fixed. You can see here that they're uh, solid pipes. It's very important that we trial fit all this and get all these pipes in the correct position. In the normal way, when we fit everything to the hull, the engine would be where I'm, hit, I'm standing now. The fuel tank's going after the pack does. And the problem being that if they're not perfectly lined up, we're going to have ourselves a bit of a pickle when we try and get them in. The fuel tanks hold about 20 litres each. Um, they're either side. They have to be run concurrently because to feed both engines. And there's a balance pipe at the front here, which we've installed, that keeps the fuel level the same in both tanks. <laughs> 